It is. Um, welcome. Good morning. Um, so my name is Simon Middlemas. I'm an architect in the digital innovation team at Microsoft, and our uh, remit is to take um, new and nascent technologies from Microsoft Research and Microsoft Engineering and bring them to the first one to three customers. And my focus at the moment is quantum computing. And this morning, I'm going to give you an introduction to quantum logic. And we're going to take a brief look at Q Sharp as well. So quantum computing takes place in the domain of um, a complex Hilbert space. Uh, it involves matrix uh, multiplication and linear algebra, um, Schrodinger's equation, a whole load of um, mathematics, which we are not going to use today. The only thing that you require for today is to understand how to add numbers together, multiply them, divide them, um, and do some uh, basic algebra, uh, things like expansion um, of, uh, of sets. One thing I will say is I'm going to go through this quite quickly. And whilst it is, um, does only involve adding and additioning, if you're not paying full attention to this, you are not going to follow the talk. Um, it's quite deep, so I would suggest putting laptops down um, and giving me your full attention. I'm going to, at, at regular intervals, uh, stop and go, are you with me? And I'm expecting you to put your hand up and say no and ask questions if you're not, and we can go over some stuff. But this is going to be a pretty, uh, pretty quick whistle-stop talk. OK, so we're going to briefly go over quantum logic. Um, we're going to, sorry, not briefly. Most of the session is going to be on, on understanding quantum logic. We're briefly going to have a quick look at how to implement some of the stuff that we look at today in Q Sharp, which is Microsoft's new programming language specifically for doing quantum algorithm development. And hopefully after this, you'll be able to explain how uh, quantum computing will help solve some of the world's intractable problems. So without further ado, OK, so Microsoft is building a complete scalable uh, quantum computer. We are starting with the quantum computer at the bottom, which uh, operates in a dilution refrigerator at something like um, 3 millikelvin, um, which is about 400 times colder than it is in outer space. Um, we're basing this on something called a topological qubit, uh, the first one of which hasn't yet been shown to exist in the lab, although we have strong evidence uh, that it does exist. Um, the reason that we're going down this route is that our researchers have shown that this will be a significantly more stable qubit the, uh, the other types of qubit that our competitors are building, IBM and Google, uses what we refer to as noisy qubits. That means that in order to get a single logical qubit, you need a large number of um, actual qubits. We expect that with the method that we are pursuing, that the, that um, error rate will be significantly lower, maybe orders of magnitude lower. Um, and because of that, we will be able to scale much, much quicker in terms of the size of the quantum computer that we are to build. We're also building that cryogenic control system, classical computer that runs at um, four degrees Kelvin. Um, and one thing that we think about when we talk about classical computers is not cool and quiet. Um, we think of warm and noisy. So actually building a cryogenic classical computer is actually an engineering challenge in itself. If in some ways it might be even harder than building the quantum, quantum computer itself. And then there's the applications and software that sits on the top. And that's the sort of thing that we are going to be talking about today because Classically, when you're doing programming, you don't think about how your ones and zeros are stored. You just think of them as that abstract one or zero, and in many cases, not even at that level. OK, so why is a quantum computer important? The reason that it's important is because some problems are what's known as in classically intractable. And that means that no matter what the improvements in classical um, hardware, no matter how far Moore's law scales, we will never, ever be able to solve those problems classically. Uh, a great example of that is the um, RSA challenge. Given a 2048-bit key, uh, very, very simple to generate the key, but can to actually find out what the prime numbers that generated the prime factor, this prime, composite prime R, is very, very hard. So does anyone know off the top of their heads what two numbers were multiplied together to give this? Totally? Cool. Yeah. Um, but it, it would take around a billion years to brute force find out what the prime factors of that number are. But on a quantum computer, it would take about 100 seconds. That's why quantum computer is important. But you shouldn't worry about security, your banking, and um, the integrity of the cat pictures that you're sharing on Twitter. Because 
by the time we have a quantum computer which is fast enough to do this, then quantum post quantum cryptography will be available, and that is cryptography which is resilient both to quantum attack as well as classical. Um, and that's something which Microsoft is uh, working in a multinational uh, uh, group to try and come up with some ways of doing it. Okay. So where can quantum computer be used? Um, we don't know. We suspect these are some of the areas where they will be uh, um, used, but when the first classical computers were invented, people thought there'd only be four of them in the world and they wouldn't be useful for very much. But it turns out that um, innovation uh, in, in technology sparked innovation in business, which sparked innovation in other things. So we're starting out thinking about areas such as nitrogen fixation, carbon capture, Serial science, etc. There may be some applications to machine learning. I'm just going to quickly focus on nitrogen fixation for a minute. Um, I find this one quite interesting. So about 100 years ago, two guys called Bosch and Harbour um, developed this process for creating artificial fertilizer. Um, the Bosch Harbour process, it's called, and it uses a significant amount of energy. Um, so what it does is it takes nitrogen from the atmosphere, um, puts it into a massively high-pressure vessel at high temperature. Um, and out comes the other side, ammonia, which can then be used for artificial fertilizer in our industrial agriculture processes. It uses something like 3% of the world's natural gas um, supply on an annual basis. That's a huge amount of energy. Um, and this hasn't changed in about 100 years. But we know of natural processes which can do this at room temperature and pressure. Uh, the bean plant, for example, is able to naturally fertilize fields. You plant bean. Uh, bean seeds, um, let it grow, it will then naturally fertilize the field. How people fertilize um, fields and field fertilize farms before this Bosch Harbor process was invented. But we don't understand how it works. We understand how we could figure out how it works. We understand how we could figure out how we could synthesize and simulate this uh, nitrogenase and um, ferrodoxin molecules which are in involved in this. But it would take longer than the age of the universe in order to do that on current computing. With a quantum computer, because it's very much um, about simulating quantum systems, and that's what molecular simulation is about too, we could do that much, much quicker in the order of seconds, hours, days. And that would have significant impacts worldwide on global food production and global energy production. And we see similar things in the areas that are listed up there. But what exactly is quantum computing and why different why is it so um, why is it so obscenely powerful in some areas well to do that we're gonna have to go back to school and kind of understand the difference between classical bit and referred to quantum bit or a qubit so we all know that a classical bit is either a one or a zero um, and we can tag multiple registers together to get larger and larger numbers so that the four bit register that we have up here can represent um, 16 different numbers from 0 all the way up to 15. A quantum register, which is 4 bits, can actually represent all 16 of those at the same time. And that's what makes quantum powerful. And I'm going to walk through a very simple um, way of actually showing how that works. But one of the, one of the side effects of this, um, this, this fact of superposition of qubits is that the size of the uh, state that you can store, do, store doesn't scale linearly like it does in a classical um, computer. It scales exponentially. So you can actually simulate a quantum computer in a classical computer. Um, and if you were going to do that, if you had 10 qubits, it requires 16 kilobytes of RAM to do that. If you wanted to go to 20, it would require 16 megabytes. If you want to go to 30, it would go to 16 gigabytes. So that's what you can uh, simulate on your laptop using the quantum SDK that you can get from download from Microsoft. If you want to go to 40 qubits, you require 16 terabytes of RAM. So you'll notice a, a, a pattern here. For every 10 qubits that you add, you are multiplying the amount of RAM that you need uh, to store that state by a factor of 1,000. So for every qubit that you add, you're doubling the amount of memory that you require. You're also doubling the amount of processing time that you require to perform operations on a single gate. So <clears throat> we have a, an Azure-based distributed quantum simulator, which will run up to 40 qubits. Um, you're not going to need to use that. 
unless you're doing some fairly major simulation. Um, but it scales like that, 50, 60, 70, 16 zettabytes of RAM. I mean, that, that's, that's not something I can even conceive of. Interestingly, when you get to 120 qubits, which is the size of a computer that you would need to simulate ferrodoxin, this molecule that we were talking about earlier um, in nitrogen fixation, um, in order to store the state of 120 odd uh, qubits, you would need to have a million Earth-sized planets where every molecule, every atom on the planet Earth was acting as a piece of RAM in order to store that state. By the time you get to 260 qubits, you require every particle in the visible universe to store that state, and it will take longer than the life, expected lifetime of the universe to classically perform one operation. But on a quantum computer, it would be instantaneous. This is where the power of quantum computing. So just uh, in, 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 in formal language, the state of n interacting qubits scales as 2 to the n bits of information. Right, so the, the bit that I'm about to show you next is based on a book uh, by a, a, a great guy. Um, he's a physics professor, I'm Australian, uh, called Perry Rudolph. Um, I highly recommend getting this book called Q is for Quantum. Um, if you do a search for Q is for Quantum, you'll find the other book by the other famous physicist, John Gribben. It's not that one, although that one is a good book. Um, it's one by Terry Rudolph. There's the Amazon bottom. Um, so I can't take credit for this way of showing quantum computing, but um, uh, I'm going to use it anyway. Um, it is not an analogy. Uh, it is an actual representation of what is happening. Um, it is a valid explanation of what is going on. So some rules of quantum logic. Uh, all operations need to be reversible. So if you take a standard AND gate, uh, you have two inputs and a single output. From that output, you can't reverse that operation and find out what your inputs were. Quantum operations always need to be reversible. So you need to be able to get back to the state that you were before from the state that you're in. Uh, you need to be able to evolve in time forwards as well as evolve in time back. That's something different. Measurement collapses states. And I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll see what that means in a minute. Um, and the other thing is that there's no cloning allowed. So you can't copy data. And that's as implications when you want to write computer programs. It changes the way that you have to write. We all copy data all the time. Not OK, so I want you to imagine that you have a wire. And on that wire can travel black balls and white balls. And on that wire, you can also put a box. And that box can do things to those balls. So if we put a black ball in, we get a white ball out. And if we put a white ball in, does anyone know what that's called? It's a, it's a, it's a not gate, it's the simplest of binary operations. Is everyone with me? Yeah? Cool, good. Um, nothing complex. So we can put multiple boxes next to each other. So if I put a, a black ball into these two not gates, what comes out? Yeah. And if I put a white ball in, what comes out? A red ball. Yeah, correct. There we go. A white ball comes out. Great. We can also have multiple balls going into a single gate. Um, in this case, we have something called a C knot or a controlled knot gate. And this beha behaves exactly the same as a normal knot gate, except it only performs the knot operation when the control ball is white. So if we put a white ball and a black ball in, what do we get out? And we get a white ball and a black ball out. So we always get the same number of balls going in as we get coming out. The control one is always the same. Okay, with me? Okay, so we've got another example. We put a black ball and a white ball in. What do we get out? Somebody other than you. Yeah, we get two white balls. So flip. Make sense? OK, cool. Right, so this is a Hadamard gate. And this is our first quantum gate, the first thing that starts to get a bit weird. So we put a, a black ball in here, and we get out a white ball or a black ball with equal likelihood. Put a white ball in, get a white ball out 
or a black ball out with an equal likelihood. You run this a thousand times, you get 500 white balls, 500 black balls on average. Um, now that might not sound particularly weird. You can imagine a scenario where you've got a, a little elf in there that's flipping a coin and making a decision on whether to throw out a white ball or throw out a black ball. Um, if we put two Hadamard gates next to each other and we put a black ball in, we always get out a black ball. And if we put a white ball in, we always get out a white ball. Now that's weird. You wouldn't expect that to happen classically. So we want to try and figure out what's going on here. So we take a peek. We separate them out and we have a look. We've tested that each of our Hadamard gates work the same way, and we've, we've shown that they do. So what we're trying to try, try and do here is see what's happening in between, see what the state of the ball is. So it comes out the first one and goes into the second. When we put a black ball in, we get a white ball, or a black ball come out with equal likelihood. So it's working right. No, it's working the same way as before. Put a white ball in, get a black ball, a white ball out with equal likelihood. And then we see what happens when it goes into the second gate. And what comes out is a white ball or a black ball with equal likelihood. Now what we can do here is we can we can we can change how we're looking at it. But what we find, no matter how many times we do this experiment, if we are using an instrument which is sensitive enough to find out what the color is, then the color of the ball coming out will be white or black. But if we turn that instrument down to a level of sensitivity where we can't tell what the color of the ball is, then the color of the ball coming in will be the same as the color of the ball going out. So what we find here is that measurement makes a difference. And that's not something that we see in day-to-day -day life. You don't ever experience the, ob the observation of something happening changing. Can you imagine how hard it would be to debug a program if when you debugged it, it gave you a different output when you were running it normally? I mean, I know sometimes we get into those esoteric bugs where that's the case, but on a normal general day-to-day -day basis, if observing what our code did changed what it did, that would be really frustrating. But in this case, it's actually very, very powerful. You can take advantage of it. It gives an exceptional exponential speed up in computing. OK, so quick review. We've got white balls and black balls. Balls go through gates. Gates perform operations. The Hadamard gate behaves differently when observed. Observation has a bit of impact. Is everybody with me? Awesome. Cool. Right. So I said that what we're observing isn't normal. There is no way to classically explain what's happening. So we need to come up with a different logic. We need to come up with a, a new way of describing this, a new mathematical construct. So what some people did is they invented a new term called superposition. And we do not know why. It's the case. But what we do know is this experiment has been done many thousands of times, and every single time it has been done, it's proved, been, been shown that this is the case, that this mathematical um, model is accurate. Um, it's the purview of philosophers, and it's beyond this talk. There's very many different interpretations of what is going on in, in, in quantum mechanics, which are fascinating. Um, wow, you guys are going to have some serious catching up to do. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, so we don't know why it's the case. We just need to accept that it is um, and then move on. OK, so what might be going on? Um, so what we're going to say is that when we put a white ball into a Hadamard gate, it's going to split into this new state where it is a white ball and a black ball. Now, this is the unobserved state. If we look at this, then it collapses down to one of those two answers. What we're saying here is that this is what we think is happening. This is hidden. We can't view it. It's a mathematical construct for explaining what's going on. Um, and it works, and it describes the behavior that we see, but we can't see this internal state hidden from it. So if we put a black ball in, we also say that it splits into this state. But we need to be able to tell the difference between the two, because when you use a black ball and two Hadamard gates, you get a black ball out. When you use a white ball and two Hadamard gates, you get a white ball out. So what we do, and this is where I get most of the, you know, what the hell I'm talking about, is we put a minus sign there. 
Now, you might be asking why we're putting a minus sign there. It's a very good question. I just want you to accept it and move on. Is everyone OK doing that? Good, right. There's a minus sign there. We need it there in order to um, show that uh, the, the logic that we see is going to work. Without that, it doesn't work. Nope. The only, time, the only minus sign is when you take a black ball and you split it, you put it through a Hadamard gate, and you get minus sign on the black. Again, some certain rules about these minus signs, which we'll get into later. OK, so the general rule is that when you have a, a quantum state like this, when you have um, this construct, and you put it through another gate, without observing it in between, then you perform the operation on each ball in that state. So on the left, we have a white ball and a black ball. So when it goes to the not gate, that will become a black ball and a white ball. And same below, we have a white ball and a negative black ball. You put that to the not gate, and it becomes a black ball and a negative white ball. So the negative sign is never operated on it. It stays there, but it's not operated. OK, same thing when it goes through a Hadamard gate. We perform the same operation on each ball. So what happens here is that we get a white ball and a black ball. And then we get a white ball and a negative black ball. Does everyone see how we've evolved the state to that? Now, we can also just remove the brackets then. I think intuitively that's something that we can accept. So that then becomes a white ball, a black ball, a white ball, and a negative black ball. What can you tell me about this? Yeah, so what's, what, what can you see? Sorry? So the, 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 the black ball and the negative black ball, they're different things, but you can subtract them. So that collapses down through um, what's called quantum interference to a white ball and a white ball, such that when you observe it, you have an equal likelihood of getting a white ball or a white ball. And that's why when you put a white ball through two Hadamard gates, we get a white ball out. And it's exactly the same thing, but with the, with, with the black ball. Um, we take this white ball and this negative black ball, we put it through the Hadamard gate. That gives us a white ball and a black ball again. And then we get a white ball and a negative black ball. But we have that negative sign on the first one. And that sits outside the state. And a negative times a negative is a positive. So that turns the white ball into a negative, and it turns the black ball into a positive. Does that make sense? So we then have a white ball and a negative black ball, which cancel out, giving us two black balls. And that's why when you put two black, black, black ball through like two Hadamard gates, you always get a black ball out, because you have an equal likelihood of measuring, when you look at it, a black ball or a black ball. Congratulations. You understand superposition and quantum interference. That's basically the principle on which quantum computing works. Now, there's some other pieces to it, um, which we're not going to get into today. Um, entanglement, non-locality. Um, this uh, model of working on it uh, does work for entanglement and uh, non-locality and the other very weird things that happen in quantum mechanics. We don't have time to go into it today. That book by, John, uh, sorry, by uh, Terry Rudolph does go into it. So if you're interested in stuff and you want to follow this through a bit further, uh, as I said, I recommend getting that. OK, so let's, we had a, let's go back to the um, CNOT gate. So here we had uh, two balls going into the CNOT gate and two balls coming out of it. And that applies to many different things. So what we're basically saying here is each one of these balls, you probably guessed, is a qubit. Um, so here we have a two qubit system. And when you have a two qubit system, you can actually combine these systems. And this is where we start getting into the, into the multiplication. Um, we can take those two states and notice that there isn't a comma between them. So we can't just get rid of the brackets. These are two different qubit states here rather than a, a larger um, single qubit state. So we can take that ball and that ball, and multiply them together, just as that and that. We can take that ball and that ball and multiply them together gives us that with a negative sign at the front. Make that ball and that ball and multiply them together. Gives us two blacks. We take that ball and that ball and multiply them together, which gives us black or white and the negative at the front. Does everyone see how we've evolved that state? Cool. 
So we can write this a bit more simply using uh, the bracket and WB notation that we've got at the bottom. And here, just a reminder that the state size is 2 to the n, where n is the number of qubits. And in this case, the qubit number is 2, so the state size is 4. I'm going to quickly go into something which will show you quite how fast these um, states evolve. So if we take our first evolved state and we multiply it by our third qubit, can everyone see how we get to that? So we've taken, um, we've taken this uh, white black here, and then we've multiplied it by the white, which gives us that one, and we've multiplied it by the black, which gives us that one. We then take this minus WW, which is just there, multiply that by the white, which gives us this one, multiply that by the black, which gives us this one, and then we carry on. Everyone with me? Cool. Uh, it, it, the order of the order of these doesn't matter. The order of the um, actual set does. So you can't change white black white to white black white is different to white white black, but you could swap that one with that one and it wouldn't matter. So what can you tell me about this? You see we've got a, a, a minus white 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 there, and oh have I no no sorry. That collapse down any further? No, it doesn't. Sorry, it doesn't. I'll come to that in a minute. So that's our fourth qubit. So we had the previous evolved state. We then multiply that by another uh, white qubit going through a Hadamard gate, which evolves out to that. Our state size is now 16. So for every qubit that we are adding, we are doubling the state size and halving the font size. That is important. I stopped here because it was unreadable after. This. It's almost unreadable now. Anyway, OK, so um, let's. So the other thing we do, we can take these evolved states and we can run them through a set of gates. So we can take that state there and we can run that through a Hadamard gate and a not gate. So what we're going to do here is for each entry in here, we are going to take the white one and run it through the, sorry, the first one and run it through a Hadamard gate and the second one and run it through a not gate. With me? That goes to that. So we've got the white one splitting on Hadamard gate into a white black, and then we flip the white to a black. And we go to this one, we take a white that splits into a white black, and we flip that black to a white. We take this black, it gives us a white and a negative black, take that white and flip it to a black. Everyone following this? Cool. We can then multiply it through all of those, which gives us that. So we take that white and multiply it by black, which is that one, take that black, multiply it by black, which is that one. And then we carry on through the rest of the series. That then simplifies down to that because we have a, uh, a white white, and a negative white white, we have a minus black black, and we have a black black. Still with me? Cool. Any questions at this point? Great. I'm going to flip over quickly to C sharp, uh, Q sharp now and show you how we would go about implementing. Implementing that. It's not, it's fine. It was when I first did this. Uh, duplicates. And. OK, cool. So Q sharp um, is a domain specific language. And there have been, there have been quite a few other uh, quantum attempts at building quantum languages, but most of them have been sets of libraries which you would then call out to within your own classical code. Uh, the, the Microsoft's offering before this was called Liquid, um, and that was based on F Sharp. It was an extension, set of extensions to F Sharp. So you would write your classical driver code, and then you would write your quantum code, and then you do more classical code after it. And whilst that was uh, a, a good step forward from what was previously there, it's not brilliant because quantum computers work differently to classical computers. So you could write code which was valid and would compile wouldn't be um, valid quantum code. What we've done here is we built a specific domain specific language which only allows you to write code uh, in a quantum manner. So if it compiles, then you know it's going to run on a quantum computer. So we have two parts to this. We have driver code, uh, which is in C sharp, um, which is just here. So what we are doing is we are setting up our um, simulator, and if we wanted to run this code on a real quantum computer, when one exists, we just change this to be 
a real quantum computer. Um, so that the code, yep. No, this is this is a normal classical. Um, it would be so it would take the code from your system. It would then do some magic on it, and then that would turn that into a set of operations, which would be sent to the cryogenic control unit, which would then be sent to the. Make sense? Cool. So yeah, this is just standard classical C sharp. Uh, we are looping over a thousand times just so we can see that probability working. Um, and we are calling into an operation uh, once per loop uh, and getting a result out. So the way you should think about a quantum computer is like you would think about an FPGA or a, a GPU. It's a, it's a coprocessor that sits there to perform operations which are specifically written for that hardware. Um, it allows you to get that acceleration, um, but also allows you to write the rest of your business logic or whatever you're going to be doing using what we all know and love today. So um, let's have a quick look through the operation code here. So what we're doing is we are setting up an operation. Um, it's mutable by default. So if you want to uh, return a result, then you need to, sorry, it's immu immutable by default. So if you want to return a result, you need to set up a mutable at the top. This is a temporary thing and will be changing. Uh, the language is still in development. So we define some qubits, which set aside some, uh, some qubits in our system, be that real or simulated. We set the first uh, qubit to be zero, and then here we are measuring it. And what we are doing is we are checking to see whether the result is one. And this is not the number one. This is the state vector one. Um, if it is, we set it to true because it was by default set to false. Everyone's following that code up there. So when we run this, we are going to get out. Um, a thousand zeros, I hope. Yeah, so we get we get a thousand falses out. Um, if I change this to one, actually no, let's not do that. Let's do so. The X is the same as the not operation that I showed you. That's a. Uh, That's the gate that we do. So I run this, and we should get a thousand trues. There we go. We have a thousand trues. So let's we now change this to a Hadamard gate, which is just an H, and run this. We should get approximately 500 trues and approximately 500 pulses. Ta-da! Isn't this the best demo you've ever seen? So if we now change this to two Hadamard operators, someone tell me what we're going to get out. We're going to get a thousand zeros out, a thousand falses. A thousand falses. And if I now change this to one as the input value and run this, we get a thousand truths. Now you'll notice this is taking quite a long time to run. And that's because it's simulating the matrices that, and the states, which is getting very, very big. So this is not a quick way of doing anything. Um, it's a very, very slow way of doing stuff that you would normally do classically. Uh, so you wouldn't want to use the quantum simulator for trivial things like we're doing here. But what you can use it for is for um, building out the algorithms that we are going to use on quantum computers in the future. And one of the things that comes with the quantum SDK, the quantum development kit, is a resource estimator. And this resource estimator allows you to figure out the number of qubits that you will need to run an operation, run an algorithm, and how long it's going to take. And that is critical right now. Because if you know the size of the infrastructure that you're going to need, um, then you know when, you, when that's going to be available. And it also gives you an idea of how long it's going to take. So the, the ferrodoxin example that I talked about earlier, the first time that the quantum research team built that, um, built that algorithm and they ran it and they used the resource estimator to figure out how long it was going to take, they'd managed to reduce the time down from longer than the lifespan of the universe to about a billion years. I mean, that's, 
That's a fairly impressive speed up, but it's still not particularly brilliantly useful. Um, but over time, by doing al algorithmic improvements, they were able to get that down um, over a period of about two years to uh, sort of the, the, the minutes, hours, days sort of area, which is a fantastic improvement. And that's what uh, the power of having a language like this and the resource estimator uh, allows you to do. It allows you to get quantum ready now so that when this quantum hardware does come available, you know you have a set of algorithms which you can run and use um, to solve your problems. OK, I realize that was a very, very quick um, demonstration of Q-sharp. There are plenty more uh, examples on the web. Um, and there's a great tutorial that walks through all of this stuff. What I'm going to do now is flip back to my slides, hopefully. And yeah, so why, why do we build a new language? So I, I kind of briefly went over that at the beginning. You can't see it. Great. Try again. Yeah, there we go. We're building a quantum computer, but still can't get PowerPoint right. Um, so, first class language, um, quantum specific features, talked about that earlier. The other thing is that it, it, it allows you to build quantum machine, which is uh, code which is agnostic to the machine that's sitting underneath it. Um, a lot of the other languages that are out there are very, very specific to the hardware which is being developed. May that be ion trap based, light based, um, supercomputer based. This is going to be, uh, as long as you write that intermediary driver uh, um, in exactly the same way that you can, uh, you can run .NET Core on uh, Intel architecture or ARM architecture, you'll be able to do the same thing with your Q-sharp. Um, it's increased programmer expressi uh, expressivity um, by being inside Visual Studio. You get all your code completion, all that, all this sort of stuff. It's inside a first-class IDE, which has been developed for many decades. It's a rigorous type system which hasn't been available before, and that then there is increases the avenue for optimization. Um, <clears throat> as people spend a lot of time optimizing their quantum algorithms, um, in the same way that sort of 30 years ago people could actually optimize those code better than the compiler. These days we don't bother. We we just assume the compiler is better than us, apart from some very very specific um, scenarios. We want to get to the point very very quickly where quantum compilers are better than handcrafted code would ever be, and this is that first starting point to that. Right. Um, yeah, it's a familiar block syntax. It's functional programming inspired. It's got a strong type system. And it's got something um, specific to quantum, these functors, these adjoints and, and, and controlled uh, operators. So normally what you'd find is when you're building out a library, you not only need to build your function, your operator, but you need to build the inverse of it, and you need to build multiple controlled versions of it. Um, and that was a, a it was an overhead to the researcher, overhead to the developer to keep that code up to date. One of the things that you need to be able to do, as I said, is that a function needs to be able to, an operator needs to be reversible, so you always need to be able to in, run the inverse of it. Um, and one of the things that QSharp gives you is the ability to create that adjoint, that inverse function automatically for many different scenarios, and also automatically create the controlled version of that, that function. OK, cool. So if you want to try it out, you can go to docs.microsoft.com slash quantum to read up on it, and you can download the uh, QDK from microsoft.com slash quantum. Right, so we've got 20 minutes left, um, and I'm now going to give you a real-world example which kind of shows why uh, a quantum algorithm will give you speed up in a, in a specific scenario. So I want you to imagine that you're about to go and rob a bank. And you, you, you drill through the sides of the bank, you get in there, and you discover that there are two vaults. And there's this little message, little sign from the bank manager saying, ha ha, I've got you. It says there are two vaults. One vault has got eight gold bars in it, and they're all fake. The other one's got eight gold bars in it, and half of them are fake. And the only way you can tell the difference, the only way you can tell whether or not one of these gold bars is real, is if you take the code which is inscribed on top of the, uh, each of those gold bars and put it into a computer, wait an hour, and then if the fourth ball that you put in, the control ball, is flipped to a white ball, then you know it's real. Now, this is a very contrived scenario. I do agree, but it does give you an example. So does everyone understand the scenario? We have, we have 
we have two vaults. One vault has half real gold bars. One vault has all um, fake gold bars. And we have a computer, which looks like this. And we take the, um, the code, which is inscribed on the top, going from uh, zero with um, three uh, black bars all the way up to, uh, what's that? Um, eight uh, with, with, with three white uh, balls. And we use that code, and then we take a fourth target ball, which will be black. And if, if the gold bar is real, it will perform a not operation on that target ball. So can anybody tell me, given that it takes an hour to find out whether or not a gold bar is real or not, on average, how long will it take you? How long do you need to be in the vault for? You've got eight gold bars. Half of them are real. It takes an hour to test. On average, how long will it take? How long do you need to be in the vault for? Four hours. Somewhere between four and five hours. That's a long time to be robbing a bank. Um, so, luckily, you've got some H-boxes. So, we're going to run our, uh, we're going to put these balls through exactly the same um, box, but we're going to put them through some Hadamard boxes first. And rather than looking at the target ball, we're going to look at the output from the um, original balls that we put in. So can everyone see how this is a kind of similar quantum circuit to what we've been looking at? Um, it doesn't matter what this real or not box in the middle, in the middle does. Um, it does something that takes an hour. OK. So case one, they're all fake. This one's easy. So in the case where they're all fake, the real or not box doesn't do anything. It changes nothing. It doesn't change the input balls, and it doesn't change the target ball. And we've already found out that if you put a ball through two Hadamard gates, it doesn't change. You can effectively consider that this is doing nothing. It's not changing the state of anything. So. If you put those three white balls in and you get three white balls out, you are 100% certain you are in a vault with no real gold bars. And it's taken you an hour. That's pretty cool. Everyone follow that reasoning. OK. The case where they're half real, this is a little bit more complicated. So we'll go through this one a bit more slowly. Does everyone see how that is the state of the balls after we have gone through the first set of Hadamard gates? So that white ball turns into a white ball and a black ball. That one goes into a white ball and a black ball. That one goes into a white ball and a black ball. And that one goes into a white ball and a negative black ball. Everyone with me here? I need to see some more nods. Yeah? Anybody not with me? OK, cool. Right. You have to trust me here, because I'm not going to go through it. But those four states multiply out and evolve to this state here. So you've got a white, a white, a white, and a white, which is that one. A white, a white, black, and a white, which is that one. A white, a white, sorry, a white, a black, a white, and a white, which is that one. And then they carry on. I've been through this many times. I have checked this right. So we are going to say, just arbitrarily, that the real gold bars are white, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, and black, black, black. We're just arbitrarily saying that. So do you remember the rule? If they were gold, if they were real gold bars, then the system would flip the target bit. So the state changes to that. We've changed our, um, uh, we've changed our state. We've flipped the bits. We've flipped the target bit on the... Uh, um, on the sets where the uh, gold, real gold bars were. And it's not obvious, and I haven't actually explained why you can do this. This is just an accounting system. It's not real. We don't know what's going on. It's just a mathematical accounting system. We can just perform mathematical operations on this. And as long as they match up with experiment when you do your measurements, it doesn't matter what you do underneath. So we, we can actually take out a common factor here. So we're going to take out white and negative black. Um, and again, you can see uh, that if you multiply white, white, white by white, you get that one. If you multiply negative white, white, black by negative black, you get positive white, white, black, black with me. 
and that carries on across the rest of them. Okay, so if we just take um, what was it? Black, black, white, which is just one of these. Black, black, white. We then need to evolve that through another three Hadamard gates before we observe it. So if we just take the black, black, white, for example, we put it through another three um, Hadamard gates, and we get white, negative black, white, negative black, white, black. Everyone follow that from the previous stuff that we've done before. That then <clears throat> multiplies out to, to white, white, negative white, black, blah, 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 blah. You get that. Everyone agree? That's OK. Which then multiplies out to that. When you have all eight of those, and you multiply it, um, and you uh, evolve them through a, those three Hadamard gates, which gives you a, um, there's eight, eight states in there. So eight times eight is 64. So you end up with this evolved state. And you now see why it's really quite difficult to do this stuff, because they, they, they get massively big, massively quickly. So is there something that you can spot about this that we've done before um, that might help us? Yeah. So if we look at the first column, there are exactly the same number of white, white, whites as there are negative white, white, whites. So they all cancel each other out. Now, there are other things that it cancel in here as well, but that doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, there are no states where it will be white, white, white. So when you observe it, when you observe the balls coming out of the system, there is zero chance of you getting in, getting out what you put in. And remember, in the first case, there was 100% chance of getting out what you got in. You would always get out uh, what you put in when they were fake. When they're real, you will never get out what you put in. So if you always get out what you put in, you know it's fake. And if you never get out what you put in, you always know that you're in a vault with at least half real gold bars. And that's taken an hour. Now, if we were to increase the number of um, gold bars that there were, so we'd double them, um, we, we would double them so that there would then be, um, th there would be 16, uh, 16 different gold bars and it would be eight hours to test, classically, it would still only take an hour on a quantum computer. If we double it again, we go from 16 to 32. 32 gold bars, it would take 16 hours to test classically, one hour to test quantumly. And that goes all the way up. You get to uh, 1024, it would take 512 hours to test um, classically, one hour to test quantumly. So in this case, we have something which scales as, uh, uh, o2 to the n, classically, but something with o to the 1, quantumly. That gives you an example of why quantum computers are massively powerful. Now, this is a contrived example. There are very few real world examples, if any, which will give you this level of speed up. But this was, a, this was a, uh, an algorithm. It's called the deutsch jutzer algorithm. And it was designed specifically to show where there was a situation where there was a, uh, a classical algorithm which scaled exponentially as you increase the data set versus one which scaled, um, didn't scale at all quantumly. Cool. So just in review, you now understand some quantum logic, I hope. Um, we've created and debugged a really, really simple quantum algorithm. So I'm hoping that you now got enough to see how the two link to each other, and you could go away, pick up the um, quantum SDK, and, and do some more stuff if that was something you wanted to do. Um, and I hope you can now explain how uh, quantum algorithms might be useful for solving some real world problems. Thank you very much. So we've got 10 minutes of questions. Yeah. I'm just going to stop you there. Every single person's first question is about RSA, but carry on. Um, what we're hoping so, yeah. The idea is that we'll get to the point where we have uh, designed a, uh, a cryptography system which is resilient to quantum computers and classical computers um, before we reach. Yes, 
yeah, so, you, so you, you don't require a quantum computer to implement post-quantum cryptography. Um, there's a difference between quantum cryptography and post-quantum cryptography. So there's something called uh, quantum uh, key exchange, uh, which allows you to exchange keys using a system which uses uh, entangled states such that when, if, there, if there's a man in the middle attack, um, you'll know that there's a man in the middle attack. Um, and that is an area which people are looking at for some very, very secure uh, cryptography situations. But we see in the future that the, the, the cryptography sis, uh, situation is going to be a combination of post-quantum cryptography, um, classical cryptography, which is resilient to quantum attacks and classical attacks, as well as quantum key distribution. Any other questions? Uh, that's our hope. Um, first, we need to build a quantum computer. Um, we've already started building the tools to allow it to um, be used by people who aren't quantum researchers. <clears throat> we're hoping to get to the point where we'll have libraries which are big enough where you can start to just compose, uh, compose things based on what you want to do. You're not going to have one on your desk. Well, I'm never going to say never. I mean, you might have one on your desk, but I mean, at the moment, they, they require a dilution refrigerator, and they're enormous, and they run at 3 millikelvin, which is quite cold. Heard. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it'll, it'll be cloud-based computing, um, uh, at least for the next decade. I don't see it being a general-purpose computing device. Question there? Um, as so, I, is, is a question: How confident are we that what is executing on a in the simulator will run the same on a real quantum computer? Mm -hmm. We are as confident as you can be in developing any software system, and as confident as you can be in the quantum mechanics is real and as it's stated. So given the laws of physics, we're fairly confident. Uh, Microsoft, Google, IBM, something called D-Wave. Um, are we being recorded? All right, I won't show that. Um, uh, there, there's a, a few other uh, national type ones, so the UK, are uh, building some stuff out based on quantum photonics. Um, there's Australia, I've got one, China are trying to do it. Um, I suspect the US government got some three letter agencies that are trying to do it too. Um, but yeah, the, 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 it's, it's a big thing. Everyone's trying to build one. And they, but they all use different physics um, or different applications of similar areas. Question there? Mm -hmm. well. they, they still um, they still all use the same underlying logic in, in exactly the same way that um, you can use C++ across very, very many different platforms. Underlying it, you still have Boolean operations. You, have, you still have Boolean logic. In exactly the same way here, you still have quantum logic. Any more questions? Cool. Well, I'll give you five minutes back. Thanks, everyone.